Our Old Testament lesson for this morning is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Our gospel lesson for this morning is from Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it came to pass that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord for today. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. Shall we bow our heads and pray? Father God, let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable to you, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. And all of God's people said, Amen. Well, first of all, I want to take this opportunity to bring you greetings and love from your brothers and sisters, not at one church this morning, but at two churches today. <clears throat> First of all, from my home church, or as I referred to a few people with a few people here this morning, my duty station. I am the uh, pastor of the First Congregational Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is uh, more than just a hoot and a holler down the road. I tried it once. Uh, hoots and hollers do not, uh, are not used as uh, measurement anymore. I'm sorry. But I bring you love and greetings from your brothers and sisters there, and also uh, from the United Congregational Church in Norwich, Connecticut, where my dad is serving as their pulpit guest this morning as well. And so I am an ambassador, not from one of your sister churches, but from two, and it's my honor and privilege to be here. Uh, we have been participating in, for the last several years in the Massachusetts Ministers of uh, Association. Actually, it's the Mayflower Ministers Association, I stand corrected. Uh, we call ourselves May Men. And I think with the uh, cold out there, uh, May is the next time we're going to get together. No, I'm not going to say. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, this morning, uh, your pastor and my dear friend, Sue, is ministering to God's faithful people, your brothers and sisters, over at uh, the Winthrop Congregational Church in Holbrook. And I'm certain that she carries your love and greetings to our brothers and sisters there. I said all of that in preparation for launching this morning's sermons. And in preparation for today, and preparation is one of the things we're going to be talking about this morning. I, I remember doing a funeral very recently, and most funerals, uh, the family of the deceased 
can be a little bit distraught at times and it can maybe not uh, quite keep their thoughts inside. I remember this particular funeral. It was actually last Monday morning, so it's that fresh in my mind. And I'm in the middle of the closing prayer, and the widow who was sitting over there on the sidelines had apparently just been so overwhelmed. And suddenly halfway through the, the prayer, and I'm going to severely edit what she said, because this, these, these weren't exactly her words. Can this sweet old boy uh, finish praying soon? This is far too long. I will leave her actual words to your imagination. You may ask me for furthers and particulars in the parking lot later on, but not in this holy place, please. In like fashion, I was instructed to, about this place, that we like to keep things rather short. And again, I started with the reference to the KISS rule, which I will hopefully try. I'm, I am a pastor. I, I preach for a living. Uh, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> One of the people in my congregation has this uh, understanding of me. I am addicted to a uh, certain beverage uh, that is currently the uh, uh, official soft drink of the state of Maine. I'm, a, I'm addicted to Moxie. There's another Moxie official. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I know I'm in the right place this morning. As I know, I was in the right place a few Sundays ago and I started going a little bit too long in my home church and my chief deacon, a very dear brother named Wayne, uh, stood up and he, he went into the back in, under the door and he just started waving a bottle of moxie at me. <laughs> Unfortunately, <clears throat> there are things you just can't make up. This is one of them. <laughs> But I said all of this in preparation for this morning to uh, sort of break the ice and to help us get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, I have a question to start off the service this morning. The question is, when does the new year begin? And the answers are possibly A, January 1st, B, the first Sunday of Advent, C, Easter Sunday, or D, Pentecost. Can anybody tell me, when does the new year begin? Anyone? I'm sorry? The liturgically, absolutely right. So, uh, so happy new year, <laughs> again. And one of the, and she is absolutely right that the uh, that for the church the new year begins the first Sunday of Advent. And one of the things I've always enjoyed in my studies is a reflection upon the church calendar. And the church calendar reflects the life of Christ. And we start off the first Sunday of Advent, with a birth announcement. You see, a, bir a birth does not start the day the child is born. I have a 15-year-old daughter. I'm, I'm a recovering dad. <laughs> and our daughter, Amanda, was born on September 9th, 1999. It's very easy to... Uh, remember her birthday. Just remember all nines, 9999. It's fun when I go to the, to, the, uh, to the pharmacy and pick up a prescription for her and they ask me when was she born. I say 9999. They just look at me kind of funny. I said, no, seriously, the only thing that didn't make it a true trifecta is she was born at 1030 at night. <laughs> this is the same girl who on her 16th birthday is asking me for her first driving lesson. Uh, in a related story, I'm also looking for a good place for bumper cars. <laughs> so we start off with the birth announcement, and then we go through the season of anticipating the birth of Christ, and then happy birthday, Jesus, and then the epiphany where he is presented in the temple, the baptism of our Lord Jesus, which we are celebrating this morning, and then we celebrate his going his growing up years and early ministry and then we celebrate or commemorate rather his journey to the cross ash wednesday is just 
February 18th. Wow. And then we go through the Lenten season, Holy Week, Easter, Resurrection Day, and then 50 days later we celebrate the birthday of the church, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and then we focus on Jesus' teaching, preaching, and ministry until we finally celebrate him as Christ Jesus our King in late November. And then guess what? It starts all over again. We're back to Advent again. And, and the, the church calendar year is fun because it seems to go so quickly at first. And at other times, the season of Pentecost goes on from shortly after Easter until Thanksgiving. And again, I come to the question, is it ever going to end? Is it ever going to dry up? No. It keeps, it keeps on going. The, the word of God is perpetual and it keeps on going and going and going. Which brings me to the start of this discourse. And my confession for this morning is I am a sacramentalist. And a good definition of a sacramentalist is someone who is trained to see and experience the presence of God in everything and everyone. I didn't <clears throat> grow up a, a sacramentalist. It just happened when I learned many years ago about the value of being able to slow down and enjoy the scenery and enjoy the sunset and enjoy what God is speaking to my heart and to your heart. And in the words of one, another favorite hymn, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. You see, the whole idea of seeing God's presence in everything and recognizing his presence in each and every person is an intriguing and a challenging concept. It reminds me very much of a Hindi word, and you might have heard this word a few times. The word is namaste. Anyone ever heard of that word before? Let me see a show of hands here. Good, thank you. You know what namaste means? It means the light in me recognizes, greets, and resonates with the light in you. Let me throw out another word. Have you ever heard of another word called Christian speak? Anybody? Believe it or not, in the body of Christ, we have our own jargon. We have our own language. Uh, for instance, when we are going out after church, across the street, for coffee and donuts. What do we call it? Fellowship. Other places it's called refreshments. We call it fellowship. I could go on. Some of you are saying, please don't. You're right. <laughs> now, in Christian speak... We can translate the word namaste this way. The light of Christ Jesus in me recognizes, greets, and resonates with the light of Christ Jesus shining in you. I'll say that again. The light of Christ Jesus in me recognizes, greets, and resonates with the light of Christ Jesus in you. In other words, fellowship. Now back to our gospel lesson this morning. We see an interesting narrative unfolding here. An interesting conversation between John, also known as Jesus' cousin, and Jesus. We read these words. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee... And was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now if we unpack this passage, John the Baptist has been baptizing people and has been declaring and sharing the declaration that Mark uh, has us read this morning, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and look and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That has been John the Baptist's message 
I baptize you with water, but there is one coming who is far greater than I am, and I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And he has been baptizing people for a long time in this message, and one day it happens. One day while he is baptizing people in the River Jordan, he looks up and he sees his cousin. And in Matthew's gospel, the same story has it that uh, John balks at the idea of him baptizing Jesus. And he even suggests to his cousin, I need to be baptized by you. The conversation that, that ensues in Matthew's gospel, Jesus takes John aside and says something like this. Uh, listen, John, I understand what you're saying. But you see, my heavenly father, God wants me to do this. I'm doing this out of obedience. So uh, can you please do this? And John finally relents. And the rest of the scene unfolds with John baptizing Jesus. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now I want to give you a historical note here. This is the last recorded time in the scriptures in which the audience hears the audible voice of God. This is the last time we hear the voice of God speaking. And believe it or not, we even have a modern day corollary to what happened. Picture yourself, if you will, at a Little League baseball game. Any of us ever play Little League here? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Okay. Anyone have kids or grandkids that play Little League? Anyone? Okay. A few more hands shot up that time. Interesting. Picture yourself at a game on a hot and balmy Sunday afternoon. Notice I said afternoon. Where, where do we go Sunday morning? Anyone? church and you can always tell the proud dad or the proud mom of the kid that just scored the winning run that's the person up in the stands standing on their feet yelling their young their lungs out hey that's my kid maybe you've even been that parent or you sat next to that parent or maybe you were the kid that just scored the winning run and you heard your, your uh, mom or dad up in the stands shouting about you. You see, in this passage, God shows himself as a proud dad. He is watching his son obey him and do his will. And at that moment where his son comes up out of the water, he can barely contain himself very much like that proud father or proud mom up in the bleachers. And we hear his voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Rough translation, he is shouting, hey, that's my kid. And I love him. My whole point for this morning is simply this. That Jesus obeyed and followed the will of God the Father. And if there is any message behind the baptism of our Lord, it is to encourage us also to follow the words later on written by Paul the Apostle to become imitators of Christ. To follow his example the words, what would Jesus do? How many of us have seen those words on bumper stickers or on refrigerator magnets or the truncated version, the initials WWJD? Has anyone seen that? 
I think I counted no less than 27 cars on the way up here this morning. Most of them were in a church parking lot around the corner. <laughs> and, yet I need, and yet I demonstrated my need for playing bumper cars. <laughs> the message for the day is simply this. If you get nothing else out of our conversation, out of our discourse this morning, please take this home with you that God's will for each of us as members together of the First Congregational Church in Marshfield, as members together of the body of Christ, is to follow Him. May our watchword for 2015 be simply two words. Follow Jesus. And in the words of one of my favorite hymns, you see, I, I mentioned several favorite hymns. Uh, this book is filled with some of my favorite hymns. So uh, almost any one that you pick is a favorite one. But this one says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. The world, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. And will you decide now? To follow Jesus, no turning back. My prayer for each of us this morning is that he rekindles in us the desire to follow him and to not turn back. Shall we bow our heads and pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the call that you place on each of our lives to follow you, to embrace you, to embrace one another as brothers and sisters in your son Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Faith is the upper statue and the largest of all the figurines on this monument. She faces east, remembering from where they had come, that God's providences were involved in their coming to America, that God's providences in all of history were working out His plan, that they literally saw it in the same way that God led the Israelites through the Red Sea. She has her foot resting on Plymouth Rock, her hands pointing heavenward. God is the maker of heaven and earth. God is working out his plan here on earth, and God leads and guides. There's a star on Faith's forehead. It represents honor and importance, the high value on the intellect and mind. The application of truth was reasoned from the mind, and though man was sinful, God could lead and guide his mind to wisdom and truth. The Geneva Bible was in her hand. The Bible can be applied to all of life. Its pages are slightly open, meaning it can be used. And so these are the elements that we find in faith. The pilgrims believed religious liberty preceded civil liberty. Religious liberty was internal, civil liberty was external. Religious liberty gave rise to civil liberty in society. So in this statue then, this monument, faith is the first key. It opens up the additional keys on the monument, represented by additional statues. Let's take a look at them now as they unpack the other five keys. The next key would be morality, law, education, and liberty, the five keys on this monument. Let's take a look at key number two, morality. Four observations to make. The eyes are not finished because morality requires us to look inward. The breastplate necklace would have been indicative or symbolic that the believer, the God follower, has direct access to God and is a priest to their family. The Ten Commandments were in her left hand, giving God's direction for life, and the scroll of Revelation, that God is the Alpha and Omega and rules over all time, is in her right hand. The Massachusetts State Legislature, Legislature actually paid for this statue to be placed, as a statement that public servants ought to set an example of moral leadership for its citizens, and boy do we need a reminder of that today. The next statue is that of law. 
It's the third key in the Pilgrim's Freedom formula. Law's eyes have a serious look to them. He has the Ten Commandments in his left hand as well. Six of the commandments deal with civil society. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not covenant. Do not bear false testimony. Those served as anchors to American jurisprudence uh, for the first 150 years of our nation's being. The left hand is extended in mercy, and so that law is known to be both full of justice and mercy. The pilgrims believed that all were equal before the law and had no special privileges and should be given due uh, that no special privileges should be given due to birth, wealth, or social status. Many of their laws came right from the Bible, and others applied biblical principles to justice, ethics, and proper restitution for wrongs done. And they had a very healthy society. The fourth key is that of education. In education, she's wearing a victor's wreath, showing she has accomplished the task of educating her children to pass on the ideals of liberty to the next generation. She has a young face, showing that she has accomplished this at a young age. There's a book that's representative in her hand. It could be the Bible, but of all the books that speak of noble things, that is, whatever's pure, whatever's praiseworthy, whatever's noble, whatever's um, trustworthy, think about such things. And so... The pilgrims valued learning highly. The number of books possessed by the pilgrims was remarkable considering the size of the colony, the high price of books, and the scarcity of personally owned books. Almost everyone in the colony had a Bible, most likely the Geneva Bible, but Bradford, Brewster, and Winslow had 300 to 400 books. Bradford studied Hebrew by candlelight, and Winslow and Standlight learned the Indian dialect, so education was a high, high thing of high regard. Also, as you learn from another webinar, they were trying to apply the Bible to all of life, and they saw that these four elements, distinct areas, were areas that God dispensed his authority to individuals, to the family, to the church, and to civil government, and each had specific roles to play in society. And so that's the fourth key, education. And then finally, the last key, that of liberty. Liberty has four components to him. The first component is his head. He has a steady gaze, a clear sight. He has a confident countenance. The rising sun on his helmet is a new day of liberty dawning. The slain lion actually shows up in three places on this statue, the right shoulder, the left arm, and behind his back. And this was indicative of the pilgrims' victory over tyranny, both religious, because they escaped religious persecution, but also civil tyranny from the king, as they set up their own governing documents, the Mayflower Compact, and began self-government in America. They lived in civil liberty. The shackles of tyranny are broken, and this is shown by the changed grasp in his left hand. Uh, these are held in his hand um, under uh, on his leg, and then lastly, uh, the chain is underneath his uh, left, or excuse me, right foot, as an example of tyranny under submission. That liberty has overcome tyranny, and then lastly, this fourth element on liberty is the sheathed, sheathed sword. Pilgrims would defend their liberty, but would not take an offensive position. The best way to keep the peace, they believed, is to be prepared to defend oneself, community, and nation. So these were the Pilgrims' five keys to maximum freedom and liberty. Faith, morality, law, education, and liberty. And on the westward-facing panel, it says this, Thus, out of small beginnings, greater things have been produced by his hand that made all things of nothing and gives being to all things that are. And as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled hath shone unto many. Yea, in some sort to our whole nation, let the glorious name of Jehovah have all praise. Daniel Webster, that spoke at, in 1820 at the 200-year anniversary of the pilgrims' uh, arrival in the New World, said this, God grants liberty only to those who love it and are always ready to guard and defend it. I will mention at uscivicstraining.org, uh, this statue is unpacked when even comes further. to the weary, a blessed release, when upward we pass to his kingdom of peace, when free from the woes that honor.